Hi, I'm Brian Wojcik. I'm here at ATI 09 with uh, Chris. We're up in Schaumburg right now. Um, I currently work at Illinois State University. I'm the Special Education System Technology Center, or SEAT Center Coordinator. Um, doing a little plug for uh, uh, ISTE's SET SIG, that's the Special Ed Technology SIG. Um, you can get more information about it at HTTP um, www.isti.org forward slash SET SIG. That's S E T S I G. Come on out and find out more information about us. <laughs> and you're listening to the AT Tips Podcast. Welcome to the AT Tips Cast, exploring and investigating the implementation of assistive technology in public schools. I'm your host, Chris Bouguet. This is episode number 47, recorded on December 31st, 2009. Do you remember the Micro Machine commercials from the mid-1980s? This is the Micro Machine Man, presenting the most midget miniature motorcade of Micro Machines. Plus incredible Micro Machine pocket play sets. Each one comes with its own special edition Micro Machine vehicle and fun, fantastic features in this Micro Machine service set and many more. And these play sets fit together to form a perfectly precise Micro Machine world. The Micro Machines collect and race and trade them from Galoob. Remember, if it doesn't say Micro Machines, it's not the real thing. No? How about the FedEx commercials, then? Okay, Eunice Travel Plans, I need to be in New York on Monday, LA, and Tuesday, New York on Wednesday, LA, and Thursday, New York on Friday. Got it? Got it. Got it. So you want to work here? What really makes you think you deserve a job here? Well, sir, I think I'm like, you don't go to figures and have a sharp mind. Excellent. Can you start on Monday? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Without hesitation. Congratulations. Welcome aboard. The voice you hear featured in both of those commercials is that of John Mashita Jr. Mr. Mashita is talking super fast, but because of this, Micro Machines and FedEx were able to squeeze that much more content into the limited time allotted for each commercial. The faster the audio is played, the more content you can fit in. But what if we take that concept and spin it on its ear? What if we take normal speech, say from a lecture or from a lesson, and speed it up? Now we have that same amount of content, but in a shorter amount of time. This strategy, along with a few others, is being used by fourth year medical student Prabhi Patel. Prabhi and I got together via Skype to discuss this concept and to get his practical experience of using it in his studies. Here's the interview where we discuss AT tip number 73, variable playback speeds of digital media players. I'd like to welcome today to the AT Tips cast, Prabhi Patel. Prabhi, can you introduce yourself to the to the audience? Uh, yes, Chris. I am, uh, as Chris had mentioned, my name is Prabhi Patel. I'm a fourth year medical student at Ross University, uh, currently undergoing the clinical portion of my uh, medical training in the city of uh, Chicago. My future plans include um, going into either um, a physical medicine rehabilitation residency training program or a field uh, of orthopedic surgery and how it relates to um, like a hardware device manufacturer of that kind of nature. So Cool, cool. Now, I'm going to guess that a lot of the audience that's listening right now might be thinking, okay, what is a fourth-year medical student doing on the AT Tips cast? Um, but what, you have some practical experience that I was hoping we, you, you could share with us. Um, one of the uh, strategies that we use quite often or that we you know, invite teachers to use quite often is to use audio um, in their classrooms. So maybe they're doing a lesson and they record that audio or, or even video. Um, as a, an alternative way, uh, st students could you know, go back and listen to that lesson again, or they could, uh, if they are absent, they could watch the lesson or... Um, you know, all sorts of different uses for, for audio recording. Turn on Audacity, which is a free uh, free software recording program. And turn that on and just let it run and record your lecture. And this way, students who miss something or need to hear it again, they could go back and they could listen to it again. And every so often when we give that recommendation, you see that, like, the teacher's face kind of, like, scrunch up, like, eh, eh, I don't know about that, or... Um, you, you say it to like a middle school or high school student and they're like, yeah, yeah. And you know what they're thinking. They're thinking, um, when are they going to have time to do that again? Or how are they going to do that again um, if it didn't work for them the first time? So um, you have some experience with that. Can you, can, you, can you share your experience with us? Yes, um, specifically. So let me, let me kind of backtrack here and give a, give a quick overview of how um, the medical education in the United States works. Okay. So in a typical allopathic medical, uh, uh, you know, graduate program, medical school program, you have what are comprised of basic sciences and the clinical sciences. Now to further break that down a little bit more, the f two years of medical school are comprised of the basic sciences and the last two years are comprised of the clinical sciences. Okay. In the first year, those classes do include medical anatomy, medical physiology, 
biochemistry, embryology, histology, doctor, pa doctor patient and society, and classes um, uh, of those nature. And so specifically as a, a first-year medical student, the requirement is anywhere from four to five, up to six hours of lecture per day are streamed to the medical students um, based based on the schedule as to who's presenting which day, so on and so forth. But it, usually the, the lecture time averages anywhere from about 20 to 30 hours of lecture a week. And that's just pure lecture. That's That doesn't include any labs. Wow, 20 to um, 30 hours a week just of lecture. Yes. <laughs> that Those numbers don't go down when you get into the second year of medical school. They actually go up a little bit more. I mean, probably close to about six to eight hours of lecture a day in the second year of the basic sciences, which are comprised of pathology, microbiology, pharmacology, and clinical medicine. So on an average day, it's very uncommon to have fewer than six hours and as many as eight hours of lecture a day, sometimes three to four days a week. So with that much information coming at you, that information dump, how do you, how do you manage all of that? So uh, one of the uh, options that our medical school gives us is the ability to watch lectures live or the second option, which is to stream lectures both in a, in a live audio video cast, a live simulcast format, or to watch a pre-recorded webcast that is available um, to students uh, usually about 90 90 minutes to two hours after a lecture has concluded. Hmm. And in, in specifically my experience in my medical education, I exercised that option was that I would watch pre-recorded lectures uh, okay. or lectures that had just been recorded at my own leisure on my own laptop using the, the existing tools uh, in Microsoft Windows that we currently have. So you're, and, you're not having to buy anything special. It's just using micro, Microsoft Windows and like uh, the media player in there? Exactly, exactly. Um, the format that, they, that the uh, lectures are streamed in is Windows Media Format. So any standalone laptop running Microsoft Windows uh, XP, Vista, Windows 7, which has access to um, Microsoft Windows uh, Media Player can stream the lectures. Okay, cool. Uh, at, at your own leisure. So. But still, all right, so if you've got, like you said, Minimum 20, maximum 40, somewhere in between there of hours worth of, of material to watch. Um, I mean, how do you do that? I mean, how do you how do you manage it all? Well, the nice feature about the way that these uh, uh, these just recorded lectures when they get uploaded is is that in Microsoft uh, Windows Media Player, there's an ability to actually speed up the lectures and watch them in a faster playback speed than just regular normal 1.0 times playback speed. And so having that functionality in the software can allow um, uh, medical students, specifically in this case, in my experience myself, to take uh, normally um, a one-hour lecture and watch it in, you know, probably about half the time. Wow. Uh, watch it twice as fast and and really get through the material and get to the information that has just been presented. And it's nice, too, because um, sometimes the way that the formats are, we can uh, speed up lectures. We can watch several lectures in succession. And it's kind of nice, like, not having such a huge break that we can just finish one series of lectures all the way through for the day. So, so my thought here at first is this, if you speed it up, like, you know, two times as fast or, or something like that, does the do you find that the quality of the of the audio is really affected? I mean, you got to it's got to sound like chipmunks or something, right? <laughs> right, right. Um, in Windows Media Player, there is the option to speed up the lecture uh, or to speed the playback of the lecture in increments of 0.1, starting from 1.0 times all the way up to 2.0 times at last check. So most of the times I would watch the lectures in uh, uh, 1.4 times okay. speed. 
And so that, that just came after watching lecture after lecture after lecture and just really training my ears to listen to a professor talk for a, a one-hour lecture and just really training myself and, and, and getting used to that kind of speech. And so it was nice because when I started getting into the second year of the basic sciences, my, my understanding and the way I was able to listen and follow these lectures had improved so dramatically that not only was I – um, watching every single lecture in 1.4 times, but in a large majority of the lectures, I would watch those in 2.0 times speed, so effectively doubling the playback speed and having the ability to go through a 60-minute lecture in half the time. Wow, that's amazing. Well, okay, the, the question that jumps into my head when I hear this, though, is that we've got a, we're talking here um, a student in school who is having some sort of difficulty in school, so maybe they're um, listening to the, you know, something that the teacher recorded. So maybe they're doing that ahead of time. You know, it's, it's been pre-recorded from last year. Here, this is last year's lecture. Listen to it beforehand. Or um, uh, we've re here's, I've recorded what we did today in class. Go ahead and listen to it tonight or, or in a few days just before the test or whatever, you know. We're inviting students in, to, to listen to stuff at home or uh, on, on their own time um, or during, like, study hall or something like that. Um, but I think the question that might jump up into a, a teacher's head is, is if you're speeding it up, isn't it going to make it harder for them to understand the information? I mean, do you find that when it's going that much faster that you're, you're, it's, it's harder to follow along? I think it really forces you to pay attention because when you're listening to something in 1.4 times the playback or something in 2.0 times the playback, you really want to catch every little detail. So I, I not only does it – you're, you do your ears train to learn to hear it better, but also your mind is more concentrated on the actual material because you're staying engaged for the entire 48, 49, 50 minute lecture that you're going to watch in half the, half the speed. You're engaged through that whole entire time. And as I'd mentioned before, it, it, sometimes it would be one concept would be lectured for two hours at a time. So it's nice that you can go watch part one of the lecture and then immediately go to part two of the lecture and just continue that stream of consciousness, that entire stream of thought without having to take pauses, without having to take breaks. Or if you did want to take a break after four hours of lecture or two hours of lecture or six hours of lecture, you can just hit the pause button, load another um, uh, presentation from the catalog and, and, and hit the material later on after you've done reviewing. Cool. Now, do you use any sort of uh, portal me portable media? Um, yes, as a medical student, portable media is very, very important. So um, some of the things that I keep in my book bag in terms of portable media do include um, MP3 players, uh, iPods, um, iTouches, um, USB jump drives, and portable hard drives. So. Gotcha. So you might take the train and you could be watching uh, a lecture on your iPod. And I know yep. I'm, a, I'm an iPod Touch owner. You know, when I'm listening to a podcast or something, it has this times two feature right built into the pod, into the you know the the audio. I can just hit the hit the two times, and it's going twice as fast. Exactly, exactly, and I think it's great for review too. I mean, I, I think it's great for review prior to exams, like having uh, the ability to go back through the pre-recorded lectures and, and reaffirm concepts that you already know or, or go back over and review, review concepts that you might be shaky about or, or concepts that you might have had questions about. So That's an interesting point there in that uh, if we recorded something in a classroom and it was, you know, teacher just turned on Audacity and recorded 45 minutes, that doesn't mean the student would have to listen to all 45 minutes. You could use the slider bar and say, okay, I'm just going to check out this this concept again that I had a question about or that I want to hear again. Yep, and having that ability to go back in a pre-recorded lecture is nice because you can really play back. You can really go back through the, the entire duration of the lecture and play back parts where the detail might have been a little bit more uh, uh, complicated than other parts of the lecture or concepts that you as the individual student didn't quite understand that you can kind of play back at a slower speed and really understand the material and, and, and understand the concepts before you do move forward. So it is nice. It is a very nice luxury having that functionality built into the software. Well, great. That's such, it's such good news to hear that um, you and other students are using this, you know, and, uh, and have some practical experience with it so that we can kind of spread that around and, and, and share it with 
other students, like I said, maybe in the, in the uh, public school setting or the K through 12 setting, that uh, this is a good way to, to review material. Yeah, it's it's definitely great. It's an invaluable tool, and it's one of the best um, uh, driving forces, which is why I chose to go to medical school with Ross, was because uh, this this technology the, and the application of this technology really furthered my understanding and allowed me to um, really focus my studies and focus my energy on lecture material and really understanding all these important concepts that a, a, um, a physician in training, a doctor in training really needs to know. So Fantastic. Well, thanks so much, Pravi. Really appreciate having you on the show. And uh, thanks again. All right. Thank you again, Chris. I'd like to thank Pravi for taking the time to do the interview. Like I mentioned during the interview, recording a lesson either in video or audio formats and sharing it with students gives students the opportunity to take control of the content. Students who are absent can catch up. Some students may need to experience the material multiple times in different modalities in order for it to gel. Others may just need the ability to pause the material whenever they need to take a break. When it comes to creating digital content, teachers might consider recording lessons, converting text into MP3 format via conversion software, converting interactive whiteboard lessons, converting screen captured videos, or even recording plays, concerts, sporting events, or other theatrical performances. Once the content is created and shared, students are empowered to re-experience the content at their own pace and by speeding up the content in a much shorter amount of time. In Windows Media Player, version 11, open the file you want to watch. Click on the Now Playing tab, then Enhancements, and then Play Speed Settings. From there, you'll be able to control the playback speed. Many of the common digital media players also have key commands to control the rate of playback. For example, in Windows Media Player version 11, you can use Control shift g to increase the playback speed. I have other shortcut key commands listed over at the blog site attipscast.wordpress.com. I'd also like to thank Brian Wojcik for taking the time to do the bumper you heard at the beginning of the episode. Brian mentioned the SET-SIG, which stands for the Special Education Technology Special Interest Group from the International Society for Technology and Education, also known as ISTE. The SET-SIG's website has a wiki with links to ongoing discussions about using technology for students in special education, as well as a handy assistive technology primer. So, I hope you head over there to check it out and get involved. Also, I'd like to remind you that you can now leave a voicemail for the AT Tips Cast over at snapvine.com slash attipscast. My birthday is coming up, and I can't think of a better gift than getting a message from you. So, swing on by and leave a message for the show. May all your interventions be inclusive, may all your strategies be supportive, and Happy New Year!